Hi everyone. In other videos, I've already discussed uh, something called dihybrid crosses, and we've talked about some of the famous ratios that show up. And if you're not familiar with this ratio, 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, you should probably go make sure you understand that before you check this out. So just a quick reminder, the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio is famous because that's the ratio we get when we cross two parents that are actually heterozygous for both traits. So for example, one parent is big A, little A, big B, little B, and the other parent is also big A, little A, big B, little B. When you separate out all the possibilities of genotypes that you can get in the gametes, you end up with a particular 4x4 four four Punnett square. Now, this is kind of an interesting mathematical way to show the representation of this, but if you actually split it up, you get a 4x4 four four Punnett square, work it all out, you'll see this in actual worked examples. And then this is mathematically what that kind of represents. So you can see what's going on here. So you end up with 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 if you group together all the possible combinations here. So where do we get this 3 to 1 ratio? Well, that comes from this basic Punnett square that you should all be familiar with. If the parents are heterozygous and we're only looking at one trait so one parent is big a little a and the other parent is big a little a remember big a is dominant little a is recessive for whatever trait we're talking about when we separate separate out their gametes because this is the mom and this is the dad or vice versa it doesn't really matter mathematically it's the same here um, if when they set up their actual gametes the mom can pass on a big a or a little a dad can pass on a big a or a little a and so here are the possibilities notice the phenotypic ratio that you end up with is three of them will show the dominant trait and only one of them out of four will show the recessive trait the physical trait we're talking about the phenotype not the actual genotypes so remember that in order for this to all work we have to assume that Mendel's law of independent assortment is followed. That's a big mouthful, and that's also explained elsewhere as well, too, so make sure to check that out. But what this means is these two genes, whatever is coding for the trait A and whatever is coding for the trait B, it means they're located on different chromosomes. That's what independent assortment means. And that means whatever gets passed on to the kid over here, the big A can get passed on to the sperm cell that's producing the kid, and the big B can get passed on. But that is just as likely as big A and a little B getting passed on, which is just as likely as a little A and a big B and a little A and a little B. So there's four actual possible combinations. And if they are on different chromosomes, then this law applies, which means that there's a 25% chance of getting each of the four different combinations of gametes. So this is a very ideal situation when the traits we're looking at, when the genes we're looking at are actually located on different chromosomes and follow this law. But like I said in the other video where I'm talking about Morgan's findings kind of updating what Mendel said, this is all Mendel stuff right here. So after some new evidence came out, we've discovered some other ways that traits get inherited. For example, genes can have co-dominant alleles, for example, in blood types where IA and IB can be expressed together to form the AB blood type. The parents could be homozygous for one or both of the genes. So for example, if one of the parents is little a, little a, big B, big B, or little a, little a, little b, little b, the ratios are gonna end up looking different. And you should be able to come up with the ratios and solve them using Punnett squares for whatever types of parental genotypes are given to you. The genes could be sex-linked, like hemophilia or like in colorblindness. And when you set up your Punnett squares, you should be able to draw them with the famous sex chromosomes, the XY chromosome and the XX chromosome. XX for mom, XY for dad. And you should be able to use little tiny letters in the top right corner to show the actual alleles and to remind us that they are actually linked to the sex chromosomes. One more additional very interesting way, which we're going to try to solve next, actually you're going to try to solve next, is something called epistasis. And epistasis means genes interacting with each other. So the results of one gene actually affecting the results of the other gene. And this makes things really weird and complicated, which we're going to look at in our next example with some mice. So take a look at this example over here on the right. And at first glance, when you take a look at it, when you study, when you look at their genotypes here, big A, little a, big C, little C, big A, little a, big C, little C, that doesn't look that different from this ratio up here. So you should expect if you have big A, little one, big one, little one, big one, little one, big one, little one, both parents are heterozygous for both traits, you should probably be able to look at this and already predict, hey, nine to three to three to one ratio. But then upon further 
glancing, you can see if you actually count up these different phenotypes, I'm not getting four different phenotypes. I'm actually only seeing three different phenotypes, even though my genotypes are predicting a 93 to 3 to 1. So when data like this shows up, it should raise a red flag in your head and some question marks should be showing up. Something interesting must be going on here. So we should be producing the 93 to 3 to 1 typical phenotypic ratio, but special gene interactions are actually happening. So I'll tell you two things here. There are two genes that affect coat color. One gene controls whether the coat has any color or not, and the other controls the actual color. So try to pause the video right now, and before I tell you which of these letters, A or C, actually codes for which of these two, see if you can pause the video and figure out if A is controlling the coat color or if A is controlling whether the coat is actually colored or not. Please try it out. Welcome back. You totally didn't pause it, did you? If you did, I love you. So if you looked at this, you would have noticed if there's no color, remember one of the gene controls whether there's any color or not. These dudes right here, these four white mice are actually albino mice. Albino mice means they don't have any color actually expressed. And if I take a look, a close look at their genotypes, what do they all have in common? They are all little c, little c. That makes me think that the C gene actually controls whether or not there's any color at all. So all of the rest of these mice here that have some color, this, these brown or black mice, all have a big C somewhere in there. So it tells me that I'm probably guessing that the big C, big C means there's color, little c is a recessive allele, that means there's no color. Um, but if they're heterozygous, like any one of these guys right here, like this little brown mouse right here, has big C, little c, since the dominant big C is actually present, it's going to be colored. So all of these guys are homozygous recessive for the small c allele. So my guess is that c controls whether there is color or not, and that a actually controls the color. So let me study that. So over here, if there's a big A, if there's any big A present, these guys all look like they're brown. And if there's no big A present, in other words, homozygous recessive for little a, then they end up being black. But notice, if you are homozygous recessive for C, then there's no color at all. So it doesn't matter what you have for A. C determines whether you're colored or not. And if you're little c, little c, you get no color. So that's basically it. So see how the phenotypic ratio changes as a result of these gene interactions. So although we are supposed to be predicting a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, uh, that's not what we're getting with the phenotypic ratio. But notice the genotypic ratio, so all these actual letters are exactly the same that we got in this previous situation here, every, over here. The genotypic ratio is exactly the same. But it's the phenotypic ratio which makes us raise our eyebrows and say, hey, something else is going on. And that is called gene interaction.